church family, I'm Broadham and welcome to our online service. Today we're beginning a brand new series on prayer called Deeply Rooted with the first message from Pastor John. But first, I just want to share with you what's coming up at our church. First, just a reminder, we will have a membership class coming up today from 1 to 4 p.m. right here at UCC. You'll learn about the story, the vision, and the mission of UCC, as well as about our denomination, the Evangelical Church, and what it means to be a member. At the end of the class, you'll have the option to apply to become a member if you like. We hope to see you there. Also, today is the last day to purchase early bird tickets for our all-church event, RSVP, A Spacious Life. You can buy tickets today for $20, and starting tomorrow, that price will go up to $25. RSVP, A Spacious Life will be on Saturday, May 13th from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. You can register for RSVP at ucov.com forward slash RSVP. Finally, we need financial secretaries to count weekly donations collected during the services used for the Lord's work right here at UCC and beyond. Looking for volunteers for a few hours each month. Days and times are flexible and training is provided. For more information, you can contact Stephen Ong. Now, as we continue our service, will you please join me in prayer? God, thank you for the opportunity to gather in all the spaces in which we gather. God, I pray um, for all the things, God, that are on our hearts and in our minds, the things that we carry each day, day to day. I pray that even so, um, even though those things may be overwhelming um, or stressful or uncertain, God, that we would continue to orient ourselves to you. Amen. Well, hello, University Covenant Church. Hey, before we jump into our new series called Deeply uh, Rooted, I uh, want to remind you that we have an RSVP event on Saturday, May 13th. It is a men and women's event, not just a women's event. I encourage you to sign up. It's all about how do we make space for mission in the busyness of life in a town like Davis in our surrounding communities. Hope you can be there. You can sign up online. Hey, I'm really excited about this series. We're going to spend six weeks talking about prayer. Uh, we'll do three weeks, uh, then a break right in the middle for Confirmation Sunday, and then we'll finish up with uh, three more weeks. I want to be honest, we had a different series planned for this season. Uh, we are going to do something around healthy church relationships, and so we'll probably do that in a later time. But the president of our uh, denomination, uh, President Tammy Swanson, just asked if our churches can spend this season in particular focusing on prayer. Uh, we have a denominational meeting happening in June, and uh, under her leadership, she just asked if churches could be preparing uh, for that meeting by focusing on prayer. And so the denomination has put out some resources for us, and so we're, we're more or less following along with that. And also, it's always good to talk about prayer. Now, as I was thinking about prayer, I was thinking about um, my backyard, and here's why. We have a sliding glass door um, that goes between our house and our backyard, and we open and close that thing. And we're in a set of houses that was built in the mid-90s, and it, it was a flawed design. The ceilings are really high, and so therefore the glass door is really tall. It's taller than a standard glass door. So the weight of it is, is awful. And what will happen sometimes is as you move that glass door, the sliding glass door back and forth, uh, you're putting so much effort that after a while, the door can become misaligned, where it's not resting where it should be uh, on the anchors of the floor. And so without knowing that's going on, what happens is the heaviness of the door gets even worse. You're, you're pulling harder, you're closing it harder. It just feels misaligned. And what I found is that when we don't become a people of prayer. In our walk with God, we feel more and more misaligned. Things are harder. Things feel like they take more effort. Uh, we feel like we're fighting against an ocean wave versus floating with it. And there's something about prayer that puts us in alignment with God that makes things just a little simpler. Not always easy, but simpler as we go through life with God. 
And how many of us are trying so hard to live life with school, with family, with work, with relationships, with finances, and it just feels like we're pushing against a, excuse me, a misaligned door? I think what God wants for us in this season is to be able just to receive from Him and, and, and grow in our prayer lives in such a way that we are able to be more aligned with Him, that life becomes a little more straightforward. Yes, there's going to be complexity. Yes, there's going to be hardship. Yes, unexpected things will happen. But for us to be centered and aligned with God in the midst of it changes everything. Um, I got a question for you. Uh, do you find prayer easy or hard? I mean, how many of you find prayer an easy thing to do or a hard thing to do? As I've talked to people, and I include myself in this, most, now there are a few exceptions out there, but most of us find prayer very difficult. Now, I say most of us because there is a subset of you where prayer comes naturally. God bless you, but just know that you're in the minority. Most people have a really hard time with prayer. Most people aren't really bragging, per se, about their prayer life. They feel a little underdeveloped in that area. I heard one pastor say, uh, and this was in the past, so his language is a little archaic, but he says, if I wished to humble people, I should question them about their prayer life. I know nothing to compare with this topic for its sorrowful self-confessions. He said, hey, whenever anyone is arrogant about their spiritual life, he would just ask them about their prayer life because that would bring some humility. The honest truth is that most of us find prayer really difficult. And I was trying to think through what makes prayer hard for me. Now, I love my prayer life with God. I really do. But it's never been easy. And I think, what is, what's so hard about it? I thought of a few reasons. I thought of four. I wonder, if, see if you can relate to any of these. Uh, the first is that sometimes I can just be too independent. I can just be too independent. You know, I don't know about your growing up life, but my growing up life, I kind of learned to take care of myself. I was a latchkey kid. I learned how to cook on my own. I learned how to get to school on my own. I learned how to structure my day on my own. Uh, though the words were never said, there was a sense of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And so I am used to getting things done on my own. Now, you and I know that if I pull the curtain back, God was involved the whole way helping me out. But at least in my mind, there is a sense of, if you want to get something done, go do it yourself. And so that could build a sense of independency. So the idea of depending on someone in prayer or realizing how dependent you are is, can be a little foreign to us. Another thing that I think is just a reality in our day and age is just being too distracted. Oh my goodness, we could fill up space so easily right now and how easy it is to have a time of silence and think what do I need to do what do I need to turn on what do I need to look on my phone and we're always trying to fill in blank spaces in our life and it's not that hard to do there's always something going on to distract us um, Paul Washer says this he says one of the greatest attacks of the enemy is to make you busy to make you hurried, to make you noisy, to make you distracted, to fill God's people with so much noise and activity that there's no room for prayer. There is no room for being alone with God. There is no room for silence. There is no room for meditation. I think part of why it's so hard is there's always something to do. There's a great TV show to watch. There's something to read on my phone. There's someone to talk to. All these things are wonderful things, but this idea of quiet silence and not being distracted can be very foreign in our day and age. So I know that we can be too independent. We can be too distracted. Here's another thing that's really true for us. I think we can be too cerebral. We can be too cerebral. You know, um, you may know this about the city of Davis, but the national average of people who have master's degrees or higher is, for adults 25 and over, is 14%. So the national average of adults 25 and higher who have uh, graduate degrees are, is, 20, is 14%. In Davis, it's over 35%. There's just a lot of smart people with degrees or getting degrees in Davis. I remember when I was interviewing here and saw that stat, I think one of my questions to the interview team was, so for me to be a pastor here, do I have to get my PhD? Uh, they said no, so I just want you to know that. That's why I don't have it yet. But the idea is we, we are people who uh, love to think. 
we love to use our brains. In fact, many of us, and this is not a bad thing, we draw closer to God through conceptual things about him, things we discover about him. That's why many of us love scripture study. That's why many of us love to dive into the intricacies of the Bible, because God uses intellect for, to draw ourselves near to him. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's one of the ways I connect with God. But one of the maybe weaknesses of that is that a heartfelt relationship with God comes harder. Intimacy comes harder. Uh, it's easier to have a head relationship with God and miss the heart part of that. Both are necessary, but I think in our community in particular, it's way easy to be more cerebral about our relationship with God and ignore the part that's a devotional part. Both are necessary, but we probably err stronger one way and weaker the other. Here's another reason I think sometimes prayer can be really hard, is sometimes we're just, and I could just be too cynical, that that we've prayed for something God hasn't answered, and it just brings some cynicism. We have disappointments in life, and we just feel more cynical. I've shared my story of when we lost our first daughter. Uh, that loss came after some amazing prayer times, a group prayer times with people in our church, uh, my church at the time, where we prayed for this child that we knew was at risk, and just the sense that God was hearing us. And then when that daughter died, it threw me for a loop. For a good six months, I was depressed. And when my wife would ask me to pray for her, I would say, why pray? I mean, what difference does it make? We prayed really hard, and God didn't answer that. Many of us have experiences where we have hoped for something from God. We have even asked God specifically for something, and he said no to that prayer, or he said not yet. And so there can be a cynicism of why even pray if God doesn't do exactly what we ask. So we have all these things kind of working against us. Uh, we can be too independent. We can be too distracted. We can be too cerebral. We can be too cynical. And yet we find that prayer was a central part of Jesus' ministry. You know, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, you're struck with how many times the author, Luke, writes about how often Jesus prayed. Let me just give you some examples. I mean, it just permeated Jesus' life. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke chapter 6, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Luke chapter 9, several times, uh, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who, who do the crowds say I am? Luke chapter 9 again. After eight days after, sorry, excuse me, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountainside to pray. Luke chapter 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Luke chapter 22, before his crucifixion, says Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond his disciples and knelt down and prayed. Luke just makes this point that Jesus' ministry in life was saturated with prayer. It was a consistent part of who he was. Now, the Gospel of John takes a different approach. It's less about how often Jesus prayed, but why Jesus prayed, what prayer did for him. In Luke, excuse me, in John 5, 19, it says, Jesus gave them this answer, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke emphasizes the frequency of prayer. In the Gospel of John, John emphasizes how prayer kept Jesus aligned with the father. It was an alignment issue. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees his father doing. John 5.30, by myself, says Jesus, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. There's a sense that Jesus has that I'm going to do what the Father tells me. I'm aligned with him. John chapter 15, he talks about his closeness with the Father. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So, given that most of us have a hard time with prayer, but also given that Jesus modeled frequency and depth with God in prayer, 
the question comes up is, how do I learn to pray effectively? What does that look like? I want to give you two things at least to start with as we begin this series. I want to challenge you to follow through with these, uh, these two action steps. The first is this. I will have a new attitude about prayer. I will have a new attitude about prayer. What is clear in Scripture is two things. One is that you and I need to speak to God, and you and I need to hear from God. It's just essential. And we have to have a mind change that, that this is essential, that we need to speak to God, and we need to receive from God, and that comes from prayer. Uh, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. God gave you a soul that is wired and meant to connect on God. That's, you were meant for that. And if you don't fill yourself with God, you will look for other things to fill yourself up with. You will look for other relationships. You will look for other activities. Now, none of these in and of themselves are bad things, but when they take the primary spot of what your soul becomes satisfied in, those things become idols and they deter you and eventually hurt you. Only God is what you're meant for. It's God's God is meant to be in your heart and to fill your soul up, and prayer is part of that. One of the mind changes you need to make is that you need God, and so do I. And to realize that you need God every day. Another mind switch that I want you to think about is not only do you need God, but get this, God wants to speak to you. God wants to talk to you. God wants to commune with you. You're not changing the mind of a stubborn God. You are walking into a God who is taking joy in you. Remember the prodigal, the parable, the, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, that when the son returns, the father is exuberant. He runs to the son, embraces him. He has found his son and has a party with and for him. That is the same attitude that God has for you. So yes, you may be grumpy, you may not want to pray, but I want to say that one of the things you can do is to change your mind about prayer in those times. One is you need God, no matter how you feel in the moment. And God loves to be with you, no matter how you feel in the moment. Prayer is a joy, not a burden. Prayer is a, uh, a reflection of something good, not a guilt trip. God meant you and created you to commune with him, to connect with him, to remain with him. And you're going to have other things in your head that are going to fight against that. But if you can hold on to these two truths in terms of changing your mind, you need God and he wants to be with you. That's the first thing is a change of attitude. But I want to share one more thing that I really want to encourage you to do this series and begin, begin this habit. And it's this, I will set aside time every day to pray. I will set aside time every day to pray. Jesus had this sense that he could do nothing apart from the Father. His frequency was so regular because he understood that he was dependent on the Father. And you and I are going to live most into our identity when we make prayer something we do daily. Now, there's ways to get legalistic about this. There's ways to be guilt-tripped about this. That's not the intention here. What I want to encourage you to do is to place yourself every day in a situation, situation with God where you have time for prayer. This might be two minutes. This might be 30 minutes. Depending on your life stage, for some of you, it could be an hour. The time at this point is not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is you set aside some time whether it be in the morning or in the evening, that you just make a commitment between you and God and say, God, I want to carve out this space daily just to pray. Will you be distracted sometimes? Absolutely. Will you be grumpy sometimes? Absolutely. Will you wonder if God wants to speak to you? Absolutely. But all those things you need to put in a box and say, though I feel these things, I'm going to put them to the side and hold on to what is true. I need this time with God, and God wants to speak to me. 
What do you do in your prayer times? Well, we're going to be talking about that in the coming weeks, but some of you uh, may want to practice some things. Some of you are going to be great at just praying and listening. Some of you might be helped by writing down your prayer requests and then writing down what you hear from God. Some of you are going to have to put distractions aside, put your phone away, and just spend some time with God. I just want to encourage you, church, that you were meant to be with God, and prayer is an instrumental part of connecting it with Him, knowing your identity, understanding His love, hearing from Him, sharing with Him your burdens and your worries, giving to Him what belongs to Him and not to you to solve. You already, if you're a believer, remain in Christ. You're already with him. Prayer just reminds you of what is true. Remain in him. Enjoy him. So my challenge for you is these next six to seven weeks, will you join me in saying, you know what? I'm going to make this a priority. I'm just going to set some time away, just like Jesus did, and say this is for Christ. Put it in your calendars, put it on your to-do list, whatever it takes for you to remember. If you have little kids and there's no time to do this, do it before they wake up or after they go to sleep. Some of you are morning people, do it in the morning. Some of you are night owls, do it at night. Whatever it is, will you just carve some space daily to sit in God's presence, to speak to Him, and to listen to Him. Make it simple and make it doable. See, here's what happens when you don't do this. Here's what happens when you get this wrong. You will continually feel misaligned. Yeah, you know that God is real. Yeah, you're a follower of Him. But the effort you go through every day will feel like the burdens on your shoulders. You're the one that's make things happen. You're the one to push things forward. When things are bigger than you, whether it be relationally or financially or directionally, it's on your shoulders to make it happen. Prayer allows you to give that over to God and not live in that misalignment anymore. Remember, Jesus says that his burden is light, that when you're with him, things just feel lighter. And when you're misaligned this way, when you're not daily going to God, when you're not understanding how much God wants to speak to you, you're going to feel a burden that's not meant for you to carry. On the other hand, when you learn to pray, when you learn to talk to God, and listen to him, when you learn to communicate with him, and when that's a regular part of your life, you begin to have a less busy heart. You begin to become calm on the inside because you know that God's at work and he's speaking to you who you are and speaking to you promises. Now, prayer doesn't make for a less busy life. Jesus was incredibly busy, but prayer does make for a less busy heart in the midst of a busy life. And if you get this right, you will make room for intimacy with God. You'll actually enjoy His presence. Again, you don't create that intimacy. It's already there. But you actually make room for what is already true. You know, that sliding glass door we had, it was such a pain to open and close because it was just misaligned. It wasn't resting on the right spot. Finally, we realized what's going on, and we lifted it up and realigned it. And all of a sudden, it became way easier to open and close. Prayer is that method of just realigning yourself with God. To not live a life where you're always living in friction with Him, but you're able to sit with Him and enjoy Him. Change your mind about the necessity of prayer. Change your mind about how much God wants to and yearns to speak and connect with you. And I pray that you begin to set aside time daily to say, you know, for this moment, God, it's reserved for me and you. Will some of these prayers times be amazing? Absolutely. Will, Will some of them feel bland? Absolutely. But you're just making space to enjoy the intimacy you have with God. And you're just making space to give your burdens to Him. You're making space to listen to Him. And nothing can replace that nothing. And you will find that God will use that in your heart in ways where the Christian life becomes way more natural, way more enjoyable, and you see his fruit in your life in ways that you could never do on your own. I'm excited about this series. Hey, if you're in a life group, we've provided some questions that you can talk to your life group leader about as we go through this series together. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach us to pray. God bless you guys.